SA Glitch Infinite. I'm King J. And I'm Benny. And we are going to be showing off Undertale. We are the commentators, but we are going to throw it over really quickly to Mr. Link 2K, who will be your runner. What's going on, guys? My name is Mr. Link 2K. Today I'm going to be showing off Undertale True Pacifist. We're going to begin the run by just naming our human one letter name. This will save some time due to uh, unskippable text. And we're just going to get the run started here in three, two, one, go. All right, so starting off, uh, this game does get pretty crazy later on. The, be the beginning is very similar to TPE Glitchless. Um, however, once we get the item called the Punch Card, you'll see a lot of very interesting skips. This is Flowey. He's going to be teaching us the main mechanics of the game, that we need to collect these friendliness pellets, and they definitely won't hurt us. And you could actually avoid these pellets, and he would give a different dialogue, but it's faster to get hit. And as for text mashing, uh, <laughs> you may hear Mr. Link go crazy on his keyboard. There, there is a certain rhythm to it. Um, you, don't, you don't just want to mash the four keys. You want to do a certain order. Uh, if I recall, it's shift, enter, ZX, I think. Yeah, I think so. Actually, it's uh, ZX, enter, shift. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, it's the fastest because it's the most accurate compared to any other forms of mashing. We call it piano mashing. <laughs> so this is the ruins. Uh, this is Toriel, who also, that means tutorial, basically. And she's going to be taking us through this place and getting us used to puzzles, but she's going to be solving most of them for us. So we're going to be getting into some uh, big RNG parts of the run here in a second. The Ruins is generally known as a pretty big RNG portion of the run. A lot of unskippable encounters. So we're going to hope to not get any encounters here for the fastest way through runes here. Right after this long hallway here. This is our first major test, was walking through that hallway by ourselves, and we passed it. So here's the... Oh. Never mind. <laughs> Good RNG there. Here I'm going to interact with this sign. This skips a phone call later on in the room that has a little bit more text boxes. And you can walk right next to the rock instead of just pushing it from behind. Saves a, saves a, few, saves a few fractures in a second. Or there, if you didn't know the pathway, you would fall down and they would show you where the safe spaces to walk would be, but Link already knows where to go. We're gonna be coming up on the Napsta Blue fight now. We're gonna just be cheering him four times. Gotta be careful not to miss menu though, especially on the last one, because if you do, it'll lose multiple minutes. Yeah, a lot of this run is uh, very quick menuing, especially for the fights. And if you didn't know, true pacifist means that we are not going to be killing any enemies, except technically one. And so each enemy has a way to spare them without having to injure them. Specifically the boss fights. Ooh, that's actually really lucky. So <laughs> as you can see, I got a, an encounter there on the same frame that I left the room. So, by doing that, I basically just skipped the encounter. Yeah, that was very lucky. <laughs> this runes is actually really good so far. Once again, these switches, uh, you're supposed to like read the notes on the wall, but again, we know which one's a hit, in which order. Okay, so I got a uh, perfect beginning to this runes. This zero extra encounters. But the RNG is not quite over because we're going to be entering the Toriel fight where she could give 
quite a variety of attacks. The one we're looking for are her hand attacks, which are a 39% chance of showing up for each turn. And touching the hands skips the skips that entire attack sequence. Yeah, each hand saving about five seconds. Which just adds on to the already painful amount of RNG that is in this beginning section of the run. Yeah, the beginning is definitely not the greatest part of the run, but it definitely speeds up later on. Yeah, once we get it to about the 20 minute mark of this run, this speed run will change dramatically. For now, there's just a lot of text mashing. All right, so here we have the Toriel fight. That's the hand attack you were talking about? Yep, so that's one. The most you could get in an RTA run is nine hands. Generally, anything over six is considered good. And every single time he's menuing, he's going to be sparing. That's good RNG. We got two in a row there. I think he's pretty good RNG. Pretty decent. Wow, that was pretty good. Yeah. I think this is a seven hand, which is actually really good for no reset. Yeah, this is really a, good. This is a great runes, as a matter of fact. So that's the Toriel fight. Now we're just going to be sparing Toriel each turn here. Yeah, most bosses are going to be ending like this, where we just have to keep sparing them afterwards. And then it'll let us mercy them. For most regular encounters, you'll be seeing Link just fleeing the fight immediately. And that's obviously faster than having to spare them. And now the game truly begins. That was the opening. Yeah, that was just the beginning of the run. Now we're going to be entering Snowden. It's basically another RNG segment, but this time with a lot more mashing. And everyone's favorite character. Uh, I wonder who that could be. Guess we'll have to find out. And Flowey's going to be a recurring person. Where Flower. <laughs> You'll be seeing him a lot. And in case you didn't know what game we're playing. Undertale. Shout out to Toby Fox. All right, so starting off, there's just a bunch of text. Yep, just walking right, and then big mashing cutscene. However, this is not really the most heavy mashing segment in the run, as we'll see a little later on into the run. This game does have really, if you've ever played this game casually, you will know that this game has really funny uh, dialogue, though. But sadly, we're just going to be skipping over all yeah, of it. Yeah, we're just, <laughs> just going to be mashing through all of it. Unfortunate. I wonder who this shadow is. It's that guy from Smash Brothers. No way. It's Sans. Oh, great. We get to hear his voices he makes. <laughs> and we're going to go behind this conveniently shaped lamp. Yeah, in that hallway there, we actually move up a pixel at the start so we could just get to the lamp a little bit sooner from that cutscene, saving a couple frames. This game has some pretty crazy optimizations that yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't even notice. So we're going to get the tough glove from the box here. You may be wondering why, because this is pacifist. We're not allowed to really kill anything. Well, the default item that we get to start off is the stick. And in Snowden, against all the dog enemies, which you can't flee from, we could use the stick on them, and that'll make them sparable right away. So this will save a lot of time throughout. 
all of Snowden. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so that, that phone call is actually an 11% chance. <laughs> so unlucky. All that good RNG and ruins had to run off somehow. Yeah, I know. And now I can't get gaster. They had to run out somewhere. <laughs> so that was Doggo, and Doggo's encounter, if you're playing it casually, is like really so, funny. Actually, quick detail there. Sliding on the ice does not actually have any footsteps, so you save some encounter chances. Yeah, if you slide across that ice, you have no chance of getting an encounter in that room. In the general category, you actually go underneath that ice to advance your step count to get an encounter in that room, but since we're not really grinding out encounters, we're just gonna slide on the ice and skip it. Yeah, there's another category called genocide where you have to actually encounter every single enemy, so it, it matters a lot more to get encounters, but we don't need them here. We really don't want to see them. So this room is normally a puzzle, but since I know the solution, we're just gonna hit that switch underneath the snow. And now we can make our way down into the dog marriage fight, where we're once again just gonna use the stick, and then on the next turn, be able to spare right away. And again, these bosses are usually pretty long. You would usually have to go through two or three times of dodging their attacks, at least. So being able to skip them with a the stick saves a lot of time. Oh yeah, definitely. Also, we're getting introduced to blue attacks. We didn't mention this yet, but anything that's blue, uh, it'll pass over you and not damage you if you're staying still. So I'm coming up on the uh, first skip of the run. It's called Geostrat. Doesn't really save a lot of time, but I'll go for it. It's pretty cool if he gets uh, it. Unfortunately, I just walked on the switch, but you could actually interact with that sign at the top while also hitting the switch, allowing you to just move forward a little bit earlier. So right here, this is a really complicated puzzle, and all you have to do is keep saying no, you don't understand. And Papyrus will just get mad and walk away. Yeah, normally you gotta wait for the entire thing to generate, but that just saves about 20 seconds, so pretty easy. Now we're actually gonna come up to an easy skip called Ice Puzzle Skip. We're gonna go down at the start to uh, manipulate our sub-pixels properly for this. And we're gonna get on the first pixel of that X. And now we could just skip that long cutscene of the bridge forming. And we just slide to the other side. So now this is the, the greater dog fight. Yeah, greater dog has a chance to give us a dog attack here, which is very similar to Toriel's hand, where we just run into it and the attack cancels. There was also a chance of a spear attack though, so we'll see which one I get. Unfortunately, the spear attack, but it's not a big deal. And he walks off. Now for the final part of Snowden, we're just gonna mash more text before the Papyrus fight. If you wanna call it a fight. <laughs> I don't know, it's a pretty it's a pretty scary fight. Yeah, I might might even uh, die to it a couple times. I guess I guess that, we'll see. That wouldn't be good. Let's hope he doesn't die. I was also my favorite part of that is just the dog twirling in the corner. So this is snowed in town. And we're just gonna use this igloo to go from one side to the other really quick. All right, now we have the virus fight. Let's hope, let's hope he doesn't die. Definitely the hardest part of the run right here. So the Papyrus can have a good amount of different attacks. Oh, well, that's not a good start. Oh, man. Oh, no. Oh, 
problem. That's a shame, isn't it? So, alright. If you couldn't tell what he was doing, he's, he's getting hit. Because after, what is it, three different? Yeah, three phases. Three phases. Uh, you'll actually be able to spare him. Yeah, it actually saves a lot of time because the fight itself is actually incredibly long, so. Funnily enough, he never actually kills you either. He leaves you at one HP so we can capture you, quote unquote. So we're just gonna be doing that over and over. And one more. And this text is just, it just has to scroll at its regular speed, so you can't mash through it, sadly. Final phase coming up here. Just gonna do the same exact thing. So this part's not really like too interesting or anything, but uh, really the next segment is when we're gonna get into all the fun stuff with punch cards and wrong warps, all that stuff, so. It'll that's, be fun. And that's when this turns from glitchless to glitch. Very, very glitched. And now this is the third time we can just spare Papyrus right away. Yep, just gotta be careful to menu over to uh, not fighting Papyrus or else we'll have to do another phase. <laughs> the last time we'll see this white screen. That's not true actually because oh, yeah, we gotta true. go back and date Papyrus after this. <laughs> So that's Papyrus, but now we gotta go back and date him, which is once again just more mashing. Yeah, and this is only something you need to do in true pacifist. In neutral, you don't do this for neutral ending, and of course in genocide, you don't do this at all. Nope. So you kill Papyrus. Neutral is actually just genocide route up until... up until, um... core. Yeah, until the punch card was found, and then it became this awesome speed game. All right, so these are the date sessions, and it's just a bunch of mashing. So now, coming up here, he's going to have to find the secret that Papyrus is hiding, and it's in his hat. And we could actually interact with this really early, right when we make it to his head. And we're gonna do the most terrifying thing and reject his spaghetti, even though it looks so delicious. Yeah, if you actually eat the spaghetti, you'll get some unskippable text. So menuing over there to not eat it saves about three seconds. And that's, that's the date with Papyrus. Now we're going to be heading to Waterfall. First, I'm going to menu down to my cell phone, though. This is for the first skip in Waterfall coming up, known as Seagrass Skip. Basically, with Undyne's cutscene by the Seagrass, you have a four-frame window to open up a text box during that. And if you do, you could just close it and then walk all the way past it. Speaking of text boxes, I guess something we haven't talked about yet is text overflow. Oh yeah, we'll see that in a bit for sure. Yeah, there'll be a lot of glitches piling up here that we'll have to talk about. So we'll see if I could get this here. It's a little tough, but I should be able to get it. Nice. Nice. So yeah, normally there's a cutscene there, but because he hit the frame, or the trick, he can just walk 
during that cutscene while it was playing. Oops, I accidentally spared. Nope. There we go. Yeah, so a little bit of time lost from the from the miss menu, but only lost a couple seconds. And those flowers, you need to put them in a line for them to grow, so you can walk on them. Yep. Now we're getting it a wash while here. Hopefully, I could flee from this one properly. There we go. Nice. Mini wing can be difficult sometimes in this game. It can be, especially if you're trying to go fast. And we're going to walk across this gap here. And we'll be in Spears 1, where we're just going to be dodging all of Undyne's Spears that she throws at us. If we get hit by one, we'll get put in a little fight where we have to dodge some Spears, losing a little bit of time. So I'll try my best to avoid them all. Oh, almost got caught there. Yeah, got stopped on that wall. Uh, oh, no. That's fine. Yeah, it's an interesting section where, like, when you get hit by it, it doesn't just damage you right away. You actually have to go into a small encounter. Yeah. So after this cutscene, we'll be getting up to all the punch card stuff. Which is where the run truly takes off. Yeah, before this it was just a lot of RNG, but now it's going to turn into a really glitchy run. Basically non-stop from this point on. Yeah, there's going to be a lot to explain and a lot to go over, especially with the punch card. Oh, definitely. And there are definitely a lot more people better than me to explain this, but I'll try my best. Yeah, the punch card is easily like the most broken thing in Undertale. First, I'm going to take a safety save because punch card is a little scary. You can soft lock if things go wrong. So we have to buy an ice cream first. Now I can grab a punch card. And we're going to use this box right here to put it in our first slot. This is where the run starts. This is where the run starts. That's correct. And we're... Oh! We're going to get right off the bat with a wrong warp right there. Basically, if you open up the punch card while going into a room transition, basically confuses the game and puts you in the room's default position, which in some cases is pretty far into the room like that one, for example. And it could actually save uh, potential encounters. That's true. Now we're coming up to Onion Sand. We're just going to use the punch card to skip it. That's a fan favorite character right there that we just don't ever get to see now. Yeah, unfortunate, isn't it? Oops. That's all right. I tried to use the punch card on that uh, encounter there so I could move well. I was getting the encounter, but not like a huge time save or anything. And sometimes the punch card only moves him like to the middle of a room, but that adds up over the course of a bunch of... Oh yeah, definitely. A bunch of wrong warps that he'll be doing, yeah. So coming up, it's gonna, it's gonna look a little weird because we're gonna be using the punch card here and we're gonna be walking down while the text is still scrolling. Like that. By holding up and down in this room, we actually move at double the speed. So just another silly optimization. It's just something weird in that room. I don't understand why it works. <laughs> I don't either, to be honest. <laughs> now we're going to do the first overflow of the run. Basically, the punch card has a one frame window between hitting use and it actually appearing. So if you hit the interact button during that one frame, we could actually interact with a text box, thus giving us text storage when we close the punch card. Also, this is the second version of Spikes. So I tried to uh, info the punch card there by the end of that cutscene, 
That would give me tech storage to allow me to wrong warp at the end of this room. Since this uh, spheres cutscene, or whatever you want to call it, it disables your menu. So the only way to do it would be is with a text box. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it, but that's alright. Now I'm actually manipulating these spheres, as you can see. I'm holding down, and the spheres show up down. If I hold up, they show up to the up. So, allows me to just get through the room a bit easier, and that's spheres too. And now Undyne is going to knock us down to the next part of the, of the game, the next section. Yeah, and we're coming up to uh, one of the scariest parts of the run, Mad Dummy Skip where, like a lot of other tricks in this game, is frame perfect, but for this one, you can't really buffer it, so. It's a little scary. I'm gonna have to use an audio cue for it. And this little cutscene here is actually an homage to who you actually are in the game. Holding right there moves you, moves you one pixel to the right, saving a frame. Again, more just optimizations that uh, add up over the course of the entire run. So we unfortunately can't just walk right past Mad Dummy because there's an invisible wall. So we're going to have to do something called Persistence Glitch to make it past the dummy fight. So I'm going to use an audio cue here and see if I could get it. I don't know if that worked. I guess we'll see. I'm not sure. So, now that I'm in the fight, I know that I either got it or that I was a frame late. So now I'm going to die as fast as possible, just getting hit by the dummies' pellets. And I'm like, Papyrus, this one actually gives you a game over. Yeah. So if I did it right, I'll get a text box here. Sweet. Nice. Got it first try. Nice. And again, that is frame perfect. Gonna take a safety save here. If Naps the Blue will let me. There we go. And here you can actually see a perfect example of how well the or how good the punch card is in terms of just skipping small parts of the run. Yeah, we're just going to be wrong warping through a lot of these rooms, putting us just a little bit farther in most cases. However, it does add up throughout the run, you know? Every second counts. So we're just going to make our way through this maze before getting to... Um, the next skip we're gonna do, which is called Flower Flow. Yeah, and you may have noticed that, like, that last section, he didn't even hit any of the lights. He hit one of them, but you don't need to hit all of them. So for this, we're gonna overflow the flower first, and then we're gonna open the punch card again while also closing that text box. The trick's not just over yet, though. There we go. So by keeping this text box open for just a little bit till the screen fades to black, it allows me to keep my movement here. And that just puts us at the edge of the room there. Perfect example of the small optimizations in this room. Yeah, there's a ton of small time saves. more punch card using there, or usage. Here we have board. Nice. Slow. So that was one dime. Not only will it allow me to make it all the way through this fight in just one cycle, I also skipped a cutscene there, so that was really good. Yeah, so Undyne, when you're green, you are not able to flee, and you're also not able to move in the box, and that's what's different about the fighting here. So we only have to do this once, thankfully, instead of 
twice or sometimes even three times. So I'm going to take damage here. This is actually going to set up for a skip later on in Hotland, coming up in about two minutes. And just making it right before Undyne catches us. There we go. That one's a bit scary, especially in Pacifist. Because I'm pacifist, if you miss it, you have to watch that entire cutscene. In neutral, it doesn't really lose a lot if you miss it, but since this is pacifist, we gotta watch that cutscene, so it's a good thing that I was able to skip that one. Entering Hotland now. This is probably the glitchiest part of the entire run. Isn't the punch guard again there? another unstoppable encounter. That's the only encounter we actually kill in the neutral ending. But since we're running past fist, we're not allowed to kill it, so we're just gonna spare. Here I'm just gonna punch card this vent, and that will allow me to get out of bounds. And just go right down there. So I overflowed that burnt pan there. Basically what that did is it advanced to the next choicer in the game as well, which in this case is the uh, stained apron. So not only did I get the burnt pan there, I also got the stained apron, which is really good for attack and also defense, which is going to be really helpful on the Azrael fight. Now, being at 1 HP there actually causes, actually causes the lizards to deactivate. Yeah, that's why we got hit on the Undyne fight. Yeah, punch carding these vents is always really funny to see. So, normally there's a jetpack cutscene that we have to go through here, but I'm just gonna skip that. However, there is a catch. That cutscene actually disables your menu, so I'm hitting my menu button right now, and nothing's showing up. Luckily, from the Undyne fight, there's still a flag on left floor one that allows us to go get our menu back. So what I'm gonna do is go all the way back to the bridge and then do a series of wrong warps to make it back to the elevator. I'm gonna do this three times throughout the entire run. There's the first one. And you'll be seeing the exact same thing, like you said, two other more times, just to get the menu back. Volume warning coming up, by the way. This is another major text overflow. Music to my ears. Everyone's yeah, favorite. Yeah, everybody's favorite. I think something was wrong with Alphas there. So this next skip, new skip, is going to be a bit scary because there's actually not really a visual cue for it. There we go. Nice. Kind of just feeling forward and then mashing the input until you get it. Yep. So once again, our menu is disabled, so we're going to do the same thing. Go back to floor one, go to the bridge and then do the wrong warps back. This time to go to left floor three. So yeah, it's going to be the exact same thing that you saw before. I didn't save there, that's fine. We're coming up on north-south skip, one of the hardest 
tricks of the run, in my opinion. We have to uh, frame perfectly close the punch card here twice so we could get out of bounds and skip all these puzzles. So there was the first one. And there's the second one. That was not bad. And that, lets you, and that just lets you get through the, through the door. The loading zone is always there. There we go. Luckily for Muffet Skip, there's a lot of backups. I think there's about six of them, so if you miss one, it's not a big deal. Yeah, so that skips the entire Muffet fight. Yeah, unfortunately, it has a great song as well. And here we have Opera Skip. There we go. Once again, our menu is disabled, but before we could go back to floor one, we actually have to come up here and uh, go into this cutscene. Basically, this cutscene sets the flag for allowing me to come back to this floor. So there's a lot faster than having to do all of North South Skip again, all that stuff. So now we could go back to the elevator. And this will be the last time for this. Now we're going into core, probably my favorite part of the run. Yeah, core is pretty great. Basically, we're going to be wrong warping every chance we get. Just even there, for example, that wrong warp saves frames, but time save is time save. Gonna skip that encounter there by punch carding it. Tried to skip that text box, didn't work out. Not a long text box though. Once again, more wrong warping here. I'm gonna open up my punch card there a second time, so that will allow me to wrong warp with this text. If I didn't do that, I'd soft lock if I tried to wrong warp. And you can tell even if you play this game just casually, you can tell that this is not where you're supposed to be at this point. Yeah, and uh, now that we solved the puzzle, you'd think we'd just go the normal way, but no. We're actually just gonna wrong warp all the way backwards to the beginning of core. In a really cool uh, fashion here, as you can see. And I'm gonna take a quick safety save once again for and Metaton skip. Just like that, we're at the once end of again, core. another boss skip. So core casually, it takes a lot longer than that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It takes so two minutes here. You could actually skip this elevator cutscene in neutral, but in Pacifist, this is actually the cutscene that checks if you spared Metaton or fought him. So we have to go through this cutscene or else the game will think that we fought Metaton aborting our Pacifist. Now we're entering New Home. This is a pretty chill part of the run. It doesn't mean it's easy by any means, but definitely a little bit of a breather compared to Hotland. Still got some more warm to do though. Of course. Oops. <laughs> okay, that's whatever. That's not a huge wrong warp anyway. Now here we have a lot of unskippable packs. Yep. Just skipped an encounter there. And I'm gonna try for this one, but this one is RNG heavy and also frame perfect, so. Yeah. Almost. That was pretty close.
Yeah, that other one that he skipped. It's very reliable. Unlike that one. Yeah, the other one's possible every time. I don't know off the top of my head how often that one's possible, but I know that it, it's very possible for it to just not work, even if you do everything right. Yeah, and these encounters, quote unquote, they aren't even encounters, they're just giving us backstory. Wrong warping there skips one of the encounters, so it's a pretty big one. And that's the first time we see the word, the name Azrael. So. Yep. So, since this part's a pretty chill part of the run, I think this is probably the best time to explain the Asgore fight coming up. Asgore is probably the hardest part of the run. So basically, we're going to use the Burnt Pan, which we got in Hotland, and we're going to try to hit as many perfect hits as we can, known as quads. Basically, quads are four frame perfect inputs in a row, and they do double the damage, so it, it's hard. So we'll see how that goes, for sure. Yeah, and as alluded to earlier, there's one enemy in this game that we will be killing, and that's Asgore. Yeah, we're also going to kill Flowey, so since we saved before, it really doesn't check if we killed Asgore or Flowey, and since it both saves time to fight them, that's what we're going to be doing. more unskippable text here. Yeah, not much to really talk about, but we are going into uh, Asgore, which is pretty exciting. So normally in a casual playthrough, Asgore is hard because of the attacks, you know, you gotta dodge them and stuff. In this case, it's pretty intuitive for uh, speedrunners to uh, dodge the attacks, but hitting quads is the hard part. So we're getting close here to the end of the new home. And then when we get into Judgment Hall, we're going to save. Yeah, this last hallway is very long with many encounters along the way, so. Yeah, I mean, it's nice in, a, in an actual, like, PB attempt because it's like a nice breather before Asgore. So yeah. I'm going to save here. And I know how much you all love our funny skeleton man. Unfortunately, we're going to be skipping him. But we'll see him. He's right there. Oh, no. Saw him briefly. It's not the last we'll see of him. Not at all. All right, here we go. I'm not really expecting much from this Asgore, but I, I, of course I'm going to try to hit as many quads as possible. A perfect Asgore in this case would be hitting 9 quads in a row, which is 36 frame perfect inputs in a row, known as a Tazgore. No harm in going for it, but, you know... It's unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see, though. On this first turn, then, we're actually going to eat the pie that we got in Ruin. It's a lower Asgore's defense. And here's the first of the quads. There we go, nice. Perfect. So again, he has to do that nine times. So that's one on nine. Ah, oh. uh, that's a shame. Yeah, that just shows how precise it is. 
Yeah, it's tough, especially on a good run. Yeah, that's what makes this boss really nerve-wracking, especially on like really good pace. Aw, oh, that's a shame. All right. This Asgore is going about as I expected. It's not crazy good, but it's not terrible. Ooh, that was a bad one, though. Getting the first three in a row, that was pretty good. Yeah, it was good. I think if I hit a quad here, that'll end the fight. Yep, yeah, there we go. Nice. Not terrible. And that's Asgore. Now we're going to be going into the Flowey fight. It's not really exciting. It's just not a scroller. <laughs> Yeah, more or less. There is time to lose, but it is definitely the easiest part of the run by far. So Flowey's going to turn into Omega Flowey. Yep, and as the screen fades to white, I'm going to reload the game right about now. And if done correctly, we're going to get this Mike Wazowski-looking guy on the left. And don't worry, everything is fine. Nothing weird going on at all. I'm not sure if you reloaded that save correctly. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> so anyway, now we're just going to have some unskippable text. Before our, the flowy fight, where we're just going to be dodging hitting the act button as fast as possible. There is one soul phase that's a little bit interesting though, which we'll talk about when we get to it. This fight is also a very long section too of the run. Yeah, it's about 11 minutes. And Flowey just consistently breaking the fourth wall here. Yeah, you gotta love Flowey. Alright, so there we go. There's all the unskippable text. Now we have the unskippable fight. Now we have the unskippable fight, exactly. If only we could find Flowey's skip, you know? It'd be so nice. And the first time you see this, it will freak you out. Yeah, and this fight actually looks really hard, but it's actually one of the easier fights in the game. Basically, you have the opportunity to get to full health after every phase. Yeah, and the health bar that the game shows you, it actually looks like you don't really have a lot, but you actually have a lot more than it looks. Yeah, even though he's taking damage here, it really doesn't matter as much as it may seem. Even with damage, even though this is one of the easier fights to do, it's far from the easiest to do damage list. Oh yeah, definitely. So this soul phase, act button's gonna be right here. It could also be on the left, depending on which way the swords are moving. And it's a good thing to note here that during these soul phases, you actually can't die. So I'll just be damage boosting through all of them. And then I'll get healed to uh, full HP at the end of each phase. And if he was actually trying to avoid all of the attacks, then he wouldn't actually be able to hit the, the axe button as quickly as he could if he just damage boosted.
beautiful. Love to see it. Orange soul phase, nothing special. The act one will always be in this top left area. Right around here. Once again, just gonna heal the full HP before the next phase. This phase is a little different though. Cloudy actually loads some save stages, so. A little bit different dodging. And here's the third one. This one is very boring. Probably the bo most boring of them all. We're just gonna hold right and mash a Z and enter here. The act button will always show up at the same place. Now we're gonna go back to the start of the line to get all the health. Luckily the next soul phase coming up is a little interesting at least. Here we go, the purple soul phase. So the act button can either show up here on the left or right side. It's a 50-50 chance for both. Some people like to go in the middle. Some people like to go to the left. But objectively, the best side to go is right. Right game. Ah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> That's so unfortunate. The RNG hits us again. So the, the act button on the right side actually appears two frames earlier than the left does if it appears on the left side. So I personally like going right just because it's a two frame time save if you get it. Green soul phase now. Just gonna wait the act button here at the top of this pan. Once again, you can't die here, so... Yeah. <laughs> this part's really satisfying to get all the healing items, though. Just comes right to you. Now the attacks are coming a little bit faster. Yep, but this is going to be our last soul phase before the final phase, which is actually kind of cool. There's a quick kill that we could do on it. So I'm actually going to get ready to reload the game here after it starts to uh, distort the audio. So right now is when I could reload the game, just like that. Now we could close that other one. This will immediately put us into the final soul phase instead of having to go through another long cutscene. Now for quick kill. Basically what I'm gonna do is try to uh, time three different attacks with audio cues. If done properly, I'll be able to end the fight a turn earlier, saving around three seconds. to time this one just like that by delaying that attack we made it happen in the uh, next phase which actually made it do more damage so at that first phase I was only doing around 200 damage tops but there I was able to make it do 250 now once again we're gonna time two more attacks coming up one coming up very soon actually Just like that, that one did 360 compared to the 250 beforehand. And 
finally we're gonna time this final attack coming up. There we go. Nice. That is the any percent part done, but we still have the actual path this for the run. Yeah, and it's gonna begin with a mashing endurance test. So if you thought Papyrus and Snowden had a lot of mashing, you're in for a treat for these dates coming up. Yes, yeah, surprisingly, Papyrus isn't the only one we date. Yeah, we go through uh, three dates throughout the past this run, which, I'm going to be honest, it's not the most fun part of the run. Probably one of the worst parts, in my opinion, but... This run also includes True Lab and the Azriel fight, which are two really strong parts of the run, so that's really good. So once again, Flowey is all about reloads, so when the screen starts fading to white, I'm once again going to reload. And then I'm going to reload one last time after I fight Flowey for the last time. Actually, that's a lie. That's my second to last reload. After I touch the door, I'm going to reload the game again to make it back to Judgment Hall and do all the pacifist stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of reloading in this fight. And this section in general. So as this screen fades to white here, I'm going to get ready to reload. Now it should be good. And yeah, this is where the neutral ending would be. Reload one last time. Oops, that one was a little bit early. That's all right, though. And that's neutral ending. Now you got to be careful to close those games. And reload this game one last time. So you might hear some sounds from the other game. So I'll close that in just a second. But first, I got to do these wrong works to get to Waterfall now. So we could date Undyne. Once again, all these wrong warps, even though some of them just teleport him to like the middle of the room. It's just time save. That adds up. Yep. Now we're gonna go to the river person, which hopefully I don't vote to Snowden. Perfect. Nice. Going to Snowden loses. Almost, what, almost a minute? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Probably like 40 seconds, yeah. It's probably the biggest miss menu mistake you can do. Other than Naps the Bluke at the beginning, yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Only the last attack on Naps the Bluke, though. Oh, I missed that wrong one. Gonna go back for that, because that's actually a huge one. Now, I'm gonna do some text corruption here at the beginning of day. So now I'm going to drop the bandage. Basically what this does is it turns what's normally pretty long text boxes from Papyrus and Undyne here to just the blank was thrown away. Saving quite a lot of time there. And now Papyrus is going to show us how to go to the bathroom. There you go. And now he just got a lot of mashing. So if you like keyboard sounds, this is the part of the run for you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, surprisingly, Undyne's date is like a failed episode of MasterChef. <laughs> okay, I'm going to point this out to everybody in chat. You see these tea boxes to the right, right next to the fridge, right? You see the one that's the same color as the table. I want you to keep an eye on that for, <laughs> for the majority of the dates here. never noticed it was the same color as the table. Or is it? That's the real question. <laughs> and once again, enjoy the text mashing sounds. Yeah, not much to talk about here, just a lot of mashing. Okay, this is when I want you to look at the tea box. So it's the same color as the table. No, it's green. <laughs> What's that all about? I've actually never noticed that before. 
just one of Toby's amazing programming moments. There's a lot of those. I'm having to press Z here repeatedly. Now we're almost done with the Undyne date, but don't worry, that's not the end of the mashing. We still have to date Alphys. <laughs> yep. Thankfully, after the dates are done, we get to some pretty interesting stuff. And that's the Undyne date. Now we get Undyne's letter to deliver to Alphys. Now we're gonna head over to Hotland. And we're gonna do the exact same thing, but pretty much backwards now, going back to Hotland. Yep. And making sure not to pick Snowden again. Now, it's actually possible to uh, overmash this river person here as well. If you mash too fast, you might interact with it as you're going up. So you're just going to uh, accidentally boat to Snowden. <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> So now we're at the alpha state. Once again, a lot of mashing. You see how that dating start is uh, showing up though, like unskippable. That one is, actually they're all skippable. It just depends. You gotta like mash frame perfectly, I believe. And alpha takes forever to speak there. Ironically, our date with Alphys isn't really a date with Alphys. It's more so playing matchmaker. Yeah. <laughs> it's very true. So now we're getting pretty close to the end of all the mashing, but not quite yet. Once we take a... This is like a little bit of a break in the run where, again, it's just mashing. But once we get to True Lab, it'll pick up again. And there's Jog Boy, Papyrus. And those are the dates. And we actually went back down here again. Yeah, so now we're going to boat all the way back to Holland once again. And then we'll enter True Lab. This is the last time we have to boat, too, so. Yeah. Um, okay, now we're going to get a text box here this time around from Papyrus. True and I'm actually going to save because. I haven't saved uh, since the beginning of this pacifist stuff, so. True Lab, my personal favorite part of the run. Oh yeah, True Lab is very cool. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of boss fight skipping in this. So finally make our way up to Hotland for the last time, and then this time we're going to enter the elevator to enter True Lab. So in True Lab, there's these bosses called Amalgamates. We'll see a few of them, but you won't be seeing every single one of them like you would in a casual playthrough. This is True Lab. So the beginning is just going to be a long hallway, but then the fun's going to begin. It's another really uh, fast-paced punch card segment. It's definitely a highlight of the pacifist run. 
It's funny because when you actually get to the pacifist stuff, you have to start with a bunch of text matching, so you feel like it's not going to be fun, but then you get to this, and it picks up again. Yeah, I like the Azrael fight as well. It's pretty fun. So this right here is basically what an amalgamate looks like when they spawn in. So we're going to use the cell on them for the first turn. On the second turn, we're going to refuse to join them. And then after that, they'll be sparable. Just like that. That was close to a soft lock, actually. <laughs> Basically, if you don't close the punch card before you uh, enter the transition, you soft lock. Luckily, you saved right before, so just in case. Yeah, definitely playing this run pretty safe so I could finish it out. I'm gonna go for a fast endogamy skip here because I really don't know the slower version. So we'll see how it goes. It's a little scary, but I should be good to go. Uh, did that work? It did. Nice. I didn't get the wrong warp there, but I could just go back for it, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, so that skill's one of, uh, when you go down and turn on that switch, there's an amalgamate that's supposed to pop up and chase you down and corner you, but we were able to skip it like that. Now we have Lemon Bread, actually a bit of RNG in this. Uh, it's not anything huge, like a second. So this is a Chomp Attack. This is one that we don't want. It's always guaranteed on this first turn, however. The second and third turns can give Laser Eyes. However, I have a feeling we're going to see some Chomps. <laughs> The of classic, all all the chomps. classic triple chomp for the fans. I know that only loses like a second, but it's just it's so annoying when it happens. I know, it's so sad. I might have missed any there, I'm not too sure. I guess we'll see. It's not a big deal if I did. Yeah, I think I did. It's fine. Yeah. Going behind these fridges just gives us a little speed boost. There we go. Now we're going to do Reaper Bird Skip. So we're going to overflow, walk right past it text. Now we regain our movement. Not done quite yet. Oh, I soft lock. There's an example of a soft lock. Oh. Luckily, I saved right before then. Yeah, it's a good thing you saved right there, too. Yeah, so this game has quite a few areas where you can soft lock. And yeah, every wrong warp has a chance of soft locking. So now we need the wrong warp out of the room as well, and that successfully skips Reaper Bird. Thankfully, out of any wrong warp to soft lock on, that was probably like the quickest one. Yeah, that was one of the better ones to soft lock on, that's for sure. Now, there's actually a slightly faster strat to do here, but I think I'm going to do the uh, funnier version for the marathon. So here, Alphys is just going to... Um, Wait, I messed it up. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. I'll just do the text corruption. Basically, I tried to get Alphys to just say smell in red text. Unfortunately, I missed it, but it's whatever. That's true lab. And now we head up to a familiar place. Yeah, and we're going to be doing our final three wrong warps of the run. So you may be looking at the timer and being like, we're coming up to Astral Dreamer. This must be done soon, but it's, again, another long fight, so. Yeah, Azrael's about 15 minutes. Yeah, Flowey and Azrael are definitely long stretch marks. I didn't really need to save there, but that's fine. 
Another safety one, just in case. The game tries to bait you here into thinking that you're fighting Asgore again. Yeah, but uh, as a matter of fact, Toriel is just going to show up and uh, throw a fireball at him, so... Once again, before the Azrael fight, we got another segment of mashing. However, we're not going to piano mash this text, actually. We're going to random mash it because this cutscene has a weird property that where if you mash randomly, it actually goes by faster than piano mashing. So this is the one case where I'm just going to go all out on the keyboard. And not only do we get to mash, we get to mash every single character's dialogue. You gotta love it. I told you to just come back. <laughs> it took Still a while. not the last time, though. One more after this. Two more, maybe. <laughs> I was telling Link that he should have done a incentive to do the genocide boss. But we ended up not doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame. But, hey, I probably couldn't do Saiyans right now if I tried anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. So now we get a little bit of a break before just a little bit more mashing into the Azrael fight. Finally. <laughs> Almost done with all the mashing. Not quite though. So this is the part of True Pacifist. Some of these bosses we haven't even seen. Uh, yeah, we haven't seen a good amount of them, as a matter of fact. We haven't seen Muppet, we haven't seen Royal Guards. I don't think we've seen a frog at this round. <laughs> I don't think we have, yeah. That means we got good runes, RNG. That's true, yeah. Yeah, we got zero encounters and then both sparables. Really good. Anyway. Azrael fight. After this long cutscene here. And the Azrael fight has, in my opinion, some of the best music in the game. Oh yeah, it's a good song. I'd agree. Are, are you there? Yeah, this is where the one-letter human name saves a ton of time, especially the Azrael fight. So we're going to begin with dreaming. And now, I could just sit here for a little bit, basically. The fight does not progress until uh, the faster part of the song. So I'm just going to wait here until that shows up, which is right about now. You know what happens when all the colors start going all over the place? This is a very hard attack to dodge. Probably the hardest in all of Azrael's fight, in my opinion. I'm gonna dream on this attack to bring my HP to full health. And then if all goes well, I'm going to go to spare because it's actually a lot faster than just menuing to axe every time. There we go. Now hopefully I stay on spare for the rest of the fight. I might need to go to heal every once in a while though, but that's alright. This fight is the main reason we picked up the apron and hot one because it heals us 1 HP every other turn, which is really helpful, especially for this fight. It might not seem like a lot, but every HP counts.
So this is a little unknown. Actually holding X during these soul parts actually slows down your soul. It was never mentioned in the actual game, so... But it yeah. makes dodging that attack pretty easy. That's something I actually didn't know, so it's teaching me something new. So far, still haven't had to dream again. Yep, but the star attack could change that pretty easily. <laughs> That's true. Nice. Oh, nice. Damage was. Uh, Alright. I might need to take a heal after this attack. As a matter of fact, I probably will just to be safe. And this is the last turn, as a matter of fact, before the next phase of Asriel. Now we're gonna get Hyper Gunner, which I'm gonna try my best to dodge. If not, it'll bring us down to 1 HP. Nice. So now for this next phase, now that I'm at full HP, I'm gonna try to not die a single time. Normally if you get hit there, the strat is to just intentionally died twice since it progresses a turn but it's faster if you could go deathless so i'll certainly try it's a bit hard though so no promises so there's four of these attacks before the second phase of asriel or third if you want to call it All right, so I have two more attacks now. Nine HP, it's possible. Get Deathless. Aww. 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 That was right at the end as well. That's all right. Alright, now for this part, we could just do their first act twice, and then we're gonna menu to the fastest unskippable text for the last one. Because all the text here is unskippable. So in this case, for Undyne, it's recipe. Now we're gonna go to Alphys' phase. And this kind of usage of the heart here, we have to shoot the Metatons. We have never used this Yeah, yet. we've never seen this before <laughs> until now. Because we skipped the Metaton fight. You guys ready to see the skeleton once again? Second to last time. There he is. He's here. He's back. He can't see us, though. Not yet. We will fix that. After after this turn. There we go. Hi, Sam. Sam. Now for this one, we're actually going to use the pie for this first turn. And then on the next turn, we'll just be able to hug Asgore, and that'll end it in two turns. Just like that. Finally, we're going to save Asriel, and now we're going to get a bit of a cutscene. A little break from any inputs here. We're nearing the end of the run as well. Yeah, very close now.
And this is where it's kind of revealed that the person you named your file after isn't actually who you're playing as. So this attack is basically impossible to dodge. It's actually possible to just sit here and you don't get hit, however. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. It's incredibly unlikely. It actually happened in uh, another Undertale Runners marathon before. Shoutouts to Shay. And we're just going to keep spamming save. So now the Azrael fight is basically done. We're just going to have some mashing to wrap up the run now. But we do have a very important choice coming up too. Yes, that is true. We will decide to hug Azrael or not. Hugging Azrael might be wholesome, but it loses about 22 seconds, so... It's a hard choice to make. Do you want to save time or do you want to hug the goat? Exactly. It's like save the animals in Super Metroid. It's like the same, same thing. And we have a little bit of text here. Now Ezreal will break the barrier. And then we'll have the very important option. And the barrier was destroyed. All right, commentators, what do you want to see? No hug. So I case. mean, I'm I'm down <laughs> for hug, but I think that settles it. <laughs> there you go. So we're going to reload the game one last time here. This is actually going to allow us to warp in just a second after we mash through all this text. And more text mashing to end off the run. So, okay, the audio is a bit weird, but uh, basically by reloading the game there and uh, loading again, that just puts us further into the room, allowing us to exit a little bit further. Now we just have about 50 more seconds of mashing and then that'll be the run. So that's how we, it's nice that we end the run with uh, what it all started with, mashing. Of course, you know it. So the time is going to be on the final text. Once the final text box goes away, that's when timing stops. And time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody in the audience. Thank you very much to my commentators, Benny and King J. They actually have some runs coming up later throughout the marathon. Uh, thank you to GSA for having me, and that's about all I have to say, really.
Thank you, Link, for having us. Thank you. If you enjoyed this run in any way, make sure to join the Undertale Discord. A lot of helpful people there. It's a great speed game. A lot of welcoming people. Uh, yeah, that'll be about it for me. Once again, thank you to everybody. And I'll see you all around. Thank you.